Hello and welcome. It is April 17th, right at one o'clock, and we would like to begin a conversation around our ESU level remote learning supports. Let's come over here. This is the website. I'll throw this in the chat for everybody. I'm pretty sure you've had access to it, but no worries. Um, yes, please. Stop the screen. Very good. And it's in. Great. So that is the website where we'll be, um, where we can find the teacher support that our ESUs are working together to uh, to, to help you provide and uh, those high quality online or offline educational opportunities or enrichment opportunities. Um, uh, a quick recap: the Department of Education is. Um, suggesting two different alternatives for districts as they engage kids with remote learning. Educational opportunities really look more like that teacher, like that lesson that, that we're used to. When, when I scroll down just a little bit, so um, about two weeks ago, we did a, a, a deeper introduction to what we mean by these two things, the educational opportunities and the enrichment opportunities. And I strongly invite you, if you weren't present for those, that, that you, you glance through uh, the elementary educators one. The, the brief recap here is that educational opportunities, as defined by our department, are, are those teacher-led learning experiences. Here we're, we're, we're talking about new learning. We're, we're thinking through uh, the, the learning process similar to how we would in a lesson or in your classroom. And, and the biggest point when, when we're thinking about these things is that we, we, need to, we need to continue to include those best practices in teaching and learning. We need to have access, students need to have access to some form of, of readings or um, some form of uh, video instruction. There needs to be some input is the point. So the question becomes, what are those readings, videos, or online teacher interactions that the students are going to access? After following that instruction component, we want to include some quick check for understanding. And, and that might be inside of Seesaw. So then the, there's a teacher video that you've made, you put into Seesaw, and then you're asking the students to summarize or maybe to solve one problem but but a key part of the process activity is desirably students would get some immediate feedback so if we're asking kids to solve a problem we want to have a teacher created worked out x and, and solution to that problem in a math classroom or if we're in an english classroom and we're thinking about cause and effect uh, we're asking the students to identify, maybe it's a T-chart, and we're asking them to identify uh, what is a cause and, and what is the effect. We want to have the teacher answers right there for the students to answer so that they, they know that they're on the right path after that instruction before they get into that practice. So, so good, that's the key distinction between a process activity and a practice activity is that with the process, even in the offline part, even in that offline component, we need to have some, some immediate feedback for those kids. The practice activity is where we're starting to reinforce that new skill or maybe it's the key terms, whatever that might be with the learning objective of the week. Finally, is a product activity. And here again, we're not thinking about a, a very deep, long product. We're thinking about something quick that the students are going to access. So we're not gonna spend a lot of time glancing through the, the, the resources because those are in our, our webinars up here. When I scroll down though, uh, the, our recommendation, this is the ESU Teaching and Learning with Technology. The technology integrationists are coming together uh, around the NDE guidance to suggest that with each educational opportunity, we focus small, keep it manageable. 
manageable learning objectives. So, so maybe we're focused on one specific learning objective. We're not, it, it, it will be impossible to continue learning like we were in the classroom. So, so what is that small, what is that manageable learning goal? We like to include things like a quick self-assessment. And so turning that teacher language from well, what is that learning goal into a quick student self-assessment. And I'll show you what that might look like in just a moment. Then there's that instruction identifying. So it says here online and offline tasks. Remembering that this focus today is also with an eye on blended learning instructional strategies. But let's, let's continue thinking about the online or offline. Maybe in your context, you don't need to do both the online and the offline. Maybe all of your students, and we know that all of our students have access to the online, or maybe none of our students are online and we're only doing packets in lower elementary or we're only doing packets in your context. So, so potentially you don't need to identify both. When you open this document here, then it gives you the ability to, to file and make a copy of, of this. When I scroll down though, potentially, and I wanna think about blended learning, these, these might become a must do and a may do activity. Instead of identifying uh, what are the online and the offline, Maybe we identify those must do and may do components and, and give students, so here is the minimum expectation, here's a, an, an alternative. You, you can also pick to do one of these things. These, of course, we would want to communicate as optional uh, or potentially with the practice, you give students more than one choice and you say pick one of these things. I wanna show you what that might look like in terms of a weekly schedule. Um, a good friend at Fairbury shared this document with me. This is something she's using to communicate her uh, weekly schedule. And so potentially you, you do identify for every one of those core uh, content areas, this is the assignment of the week or this is the activity of the day. So on Monday, you'll do this, on Tuesday, you'll do that for every one of those different content areas. Or potentially you do something like this. I'm gonna stop the screen share and then pop this document into our uh, chat here too and share my screen once more. So this is a, it's very similar. This is a, uh, a document. Do I need to press the share button? I might. Nope, it says everybody with the link can, can view it. So let's, let's glance at this together. So it looks very similar, but with an eye on the potential that you engage students in one educational activity or one educational opportunity on a given day, and then you give students some choice around an enrichment activity. Potentially here, you, you do identify, I need you to do this one thing, but now you have some options around what those may do's might be. Potentially those may do's might be organized like a choice board. When I scroll down, so when we talk about enrichment activities, these are different. These uh, from our educational opportunities. With enrichment opportunities, the Department of Education defines these as kind of that ongoing development of a particular knowledge or skill in that continuum of learning within a grade. I, I really strongly recommend if we're thinking about enrichment opportunities that we consider including gamified independent learning platforms that would allow us to uh, set out, uh, engage kids in mastery paths. So what do we mean by mastery paths? Within those independent learning platforms, uh, you have the ability to let kids take that diagnostic test and then they move at their own pace, at their own, on their own path 
through the content. I'm not necessarily suggesting to, to only do enrichment. I think we need to follow what is expected out of our districts. And, and there again, I, I think potentially, um, we could engage kids in a combination in the elementary of educational opportunities and also those en enrichment opportunities. Let's have a quick conversation and I'd love to uh, hear from you too. Um, our Department of Education just yesterday came out with a little bit more guidance around uh, what we are doing and what, does, what is remote learning. One of the components was uh, recommendations for time on task for kids. Uh, according to the Department of Education, they're, they're recommending that districts consider for preschool students only really having an hour of work each day, about an hour of work each day. In kindergarten through second grade, their recommendation is an hour and a half. Third through fifth is around two hours. That's, that's, those are the expectations for, for our kiddos. So when I come back to sharing my screen here and, and we think about what can kids do in an hour or an hour and a half or an hour or two hours even, I think maybe in two hours, we might be able to get through two educational opportunities, two of these lessons where students are engaged in some input, some instruction, in some practice, and then get to that apply phase of creating something. Maybe in two hours we could get through two of those things. But if we're thinking an hour and a half, it, I think it'd be hard to get kids all the way through a, a true educational opportunity. And, and I, I really wanna reemphasize that if we're expecting our students to, to do something with new learning, it's, it's imperative that we do include either that, that digital copy of, of input where it might be a reading, it might be a video, or a paper copy if we're thinking about an, an offline alternative that we're, in, we're providing the parents or the family member who's going to help the student learn this new concept, some guidance around what is that objective. And so, but once again, potentially uh, an expectation might be that one, uh, every day you'll have a lesson of the day, that educational opportunity, that new learning experience. And maybe we might include an enrichment activity of the day. So I, once again, I want to value the fact that we're, we're thinking about this from an, uh, a blended learning, um, blended learning best practices approach. So, so when I scroll down just a little bit, I'd like to share with you, this is, this is another way, potentially, you could organize uh, enrichment opportunities. Remembering that with enrichment opportunities, we don't necessarily need to require that students are going to have input. This isn't necessarily new learning. So with, within enrichment activities, maybe we do leverage those gamified independent learning platforms, uh, like a Prodigy or a Dreamscape. Um, you might include things like uh, participate in an ESU5 science class. Um, that, that would be a wonderful enrichment opportunity. Uh, you might include some content area specific activities, but, but not necessarily focused. So that why is this not an educational opportunity, Nick? Well, this isn't an educational opportunity because we don't have a focused objective. Those educational opportunities, when I scroll back up here, remembering that educate the definition from our Department of Education around educational opportunities is that we're focused on standards-based or skill-based practice. And, and so new learning around that particular, that specific skill. So within our example of a, of a choice board, 
um, then we might not have that, that input. And, and so how could we turn this into an educational opportunity? Well, so the graphic National Geographic, uh, that might be a great source for that English language uh, arts classroom. But if this were to be an educational opportunity, we would need to identify what is the purpose of reading it? Are, are we looking for cause and effect? Are we looking to identify the author's um, intention here, the author's voice? And then, then we need a, a quick piece of instruction around author's voice. Maybe that, that video, maybe that reading, and, and a quick process activity for helping students understand. Maybe in that context, it's uh, the students are defining what is author's voice and getting some immediate feedback on their understanding of what is author's voice. Now th this activity where you read and then you fill out a nonfiction graphic organizer, that would be a great example of a practice activity. Excellent. And then including a product activity like, okay, summarize what you did in Seesaw, record your voice share out your graphic organizer and explain why you put these different components in the different boxes that you put them. So excellent. That's the distinction between those educational opportunities and those enrichment opportunities. And I wanna circle back once more to, to the idea that if, if we're thinking about time on task for our kiddos, it's, it's if we're following our NDE guidelines, we might not have room for a lesson for every single one of those content, act, content areas. And that's okay. If you want to continue uh, with, with organizing by content area, that's, that's fine. But maybe some of those content area things are enrichment activities rather than those educational opportunities. So, so that once again, maybe one of these things or two of these content areas, if you're in fourth or fifth or third grade even, maybe two of them could be educational opportunities where we are expecting kids to get through that input, the practice and the quick product. And then two of them are enrichment activities that are more similar to that choice board that we just glanced at. But, but ensuring that, that you have a, a, a good realistic expectation for how much stu time students are going to take in, in getting this done and that it matches, that expectation matches uh, your district guidance, your district expectations for how much time students are taking. So wonderful, we're, we're thinking about uh, providing some degree of student choice. So I'd, I'd love to push you over here under blended learning best practices. And then when you go to knowledge deepening, this would take you and show you uh, some, some ideas for what meaningful choices, some, some tool ideas for what you might do. But then also I'd like to really highlight how do we promote student choice? When you click to learn more and we scroll down, um, this, this is in relation to the uh, statewide project that our ESUs are leading around blended learning best practices. So one way we think about providing some degree of student choice is, is around different modalities of learning. So when, when we come back to this idea that we might engage students in an educational opportunity, and we were thinking about potentially instead of online or offline that we're identifying must do's and may do's, potentially with the practice here, you might allow students to do something that's a little bit more tactile. So you're engaging kids in multiple modalities of learning or, or maybe a, a little bit more kinesthetic potentially, I, I'm not sure. But, but that's one way we could think about providing students choice. Effectively, we're thinking about how could students do this activity, whatever this activity might be, how could they do it 
in a way that is more tactile, maybe more visual, maybe more, uh, so utilizing the, those multiple modalities of learning. When I scroll down just a little bit, another key idea, another key concept is this multiple depths of knowledge. And if, if you're following those recommendations around introduction or, or instruction, practice, and product, then you will hit on these multiple modalities of learning. That at DOK1, where we're thinking about memorizing something new, we, we have that input or that instruction with the quick process. Well, the, the, the process activity is really to help students remember, help students understand that, that new objective, whatever that objective may be. When we get to practice, now they're beginning to apply. They're, they're, they're beginning to, uh, maybe it's that uh, question set in the math classroom where we're gonna ask students to complete uh, five to 10 different uh, examples, different questions. Or, or maybe we're beginning to um, apply the vocabulary. But when we get to product, our goal is that kids are, are getting even deeper into the, that depth of knowledge. And, and so we're, we're engaging them and in explaining their thought process. In a math classroom, my favorite example of this is, a, is what Marzano calls a worked example, where students are going to solve a word problem and then they're going to record their voice explaining their thought process behind whatever that may, may be. In a social studies classroom, maybe we, our input was around, um, let's, let's think, um, in the social studies classroom, it was uh, around the Revolutionary War, maybe, great. And, and so we had some input around um, why, what was the impetus for the Revolutionary War? With the thinking, then maybe kids were practicing the vocabulary that we, that we covered in that input, that instruction. And with the critical thinking, they need to take a stand. Either you're um, the, a member of the colonies and you're explaining why the Revolutionary War was, is, is necessary, or maybe you're uh, in England and you're explaining why the Revolutionary War is a bad thing but you're making a claim and you're citing some evidence potentially. That, that's an example of how our structure for thinking about those um, educational opportunities will help ensure that you're getting kids through into a deeper depth of knowledge. I want to highlight another example when we think about voice. So this was when we, when we talk about the practice segment, we, we talk about choice, some degree of student control over how kids are practicing. When we get to the application component, that product, now we're thinking about some degree of student voice. How are students going to have some degree of control over what, what it is they're doing to show you what they know? Um, but, but I wanna focus in, in the three minutes that we have left on this idea of assessing student work. The, there's, there's real guidance right now coming from our Department of Education. There's good thoughts coming, not just from NDE, but across our country around not focusing feedback on numbers or a t a traditional grading that we need to give feedback uh, on the, the thoughts. And, and, and so giving feedback, how can we give good feedback if we're giving students some degree of, of control over how they're showing us what they know? So promoting student voice. Um, if, if we're doing that, that means that we need to engage kids in, in some sort of rubric feedback. And the, the point that I want to make right now is this around format versus content. And, and that instead of focusing feedback on the format of how, how if, we're, if we're asking kids to give us a Google slide, one slide, we don't want to focus feedback on the, the color of the text or the spacing of the words. 
we want to focus the feedback on, on the content. And, and so the definition of the key terms or the illustration of the key process or that justification or the application to the real world problems. The point, the point that's being made across the country right now is that we, we don't want kids to be discouraged throughout the learning process. We want to encourage them. Remembering that for every piece of critical feedback, we want to give two pieces of positive feedback as well. So good. Let's come back to our, our homepage here. So thank you. This is, we're almost to the end of the introduction. And then we're, I want to get into a conversation with, with you all around um, what, is do, what is working and, and what are some struggles that we're having. But, but in today's quick conversation, we looked at educational opportunities and enrichment opportunities with, with an eye on those blended learning best practices. And I truly invite you, if you were unable to join our ed elementary session where we introduced these things in greater depth, I invite you to watch that. And if, if you're one of our blended learning experts, I invite you to dive deeper into some of the resources that we've developed around these different components. When I scroll down to the educational opportunities here, um, the, these are color coded to meet our blended learning best practices. That red is the empower learner activity where students are going to self assess and think about how well uh, they're able, how well, how do they feel about their ability to do this, that, or the other. That self assessment is important to help inform the students what are we learning. And that direct instruction is here under the instruction component where we want to include Yes, some, some, some instruction, but also that quick process activity, um, engaging kids in, in that to make sure that they're on the right path and their understanding around whatever the objective may be. At the green, it's the knowledge deepening, the practice segment of, of, your, of your blended learning experience. And there's a lot of great resources there, including multiple choice board templates that you're able to, to make copies of and make your own. Finally, is that knowledge application component, that blue piece, where students are creating something. And there's a lot more guidance on our, on our site here around how uh, you might think through uh, providing feedback, structuring that, maybe giving students some control over what they're doing to show you what they know. So with that, I'm gonna stop the screen share and we'll 